Okay, we will kick off. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is James Woolard. I use the pronouns he and him uh, and I lead the reactor program across EMEA. Uh, I'm also part of the leadership team for Gleam in the UK, which is Microsoft's employee resource group for LGBTQI plus folk. Uh, pretty excited for about today's session. Uh, we're talking about programming for accessibility and uh, thanks to some exceptional planning today it actually falls on International Day for people with a disability. So uh, we'll be touching on that a little bit as we get into the session. Uh, I'm joined today by Rory Preddy, who is one of our senior cloud advocates. Uh, he's going to be leading to today's session. Um, so I'll just pass over to him to say hi and introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Um, and hi from sunny Johannesburg in South Africa. Yes. We do still exist. Um, and uh, thank you so much for the introduction, James. And it's such a, an honor and a privilege uh, to be able to speak on accessibility on uh, the this uh, momentous day at the UN World Disability Day. And we've got some really exciting technology to show you around how Microsoft empowers everyone using our accessibility tool chain. Um, and uh, um, James, I believe you've got some really interesting questions that are going to drive the, the conversation and, and, and through the, the dialogue. I do. I, I hope so, for sure. Um, so a couple of pieces of admin before we get into it. So we are recording today's session. Um, we have a Q&A, so if you want to post any questions, we will be keeping an eye on it. Um, a quick word, we've just put our code of conduct up on the screen there. So if you do post any questions, uh, any kind of interaction is just uh, remember to be respectful and consideration of all people as we go through. Um, so that should be it for now, quite straightforward. So I'll kick off with some questions, Rory. So um, I think the first one, um, can you give us a little bit more detail and background about yourself, please? Yes, you can. Um, and um, well, first, let me let me show you who I am. So I'm uh, I don't have a ruler here, but uh, th that's about four foot. So I'm about four foot one. And that one inch is actually very important to me because, you know, um, that's about 120 centimeters for you uh, American non metric folk. And I'm 50 kilos um, and I was 65 kilos before the lockdown. So I've used this time really uh, productively. Um, and I have achondroplasia, uh, which is a very long sounding word for dwarfism, a little person. Um, and uh, throughout my life, I've really been uh, bolting on um, my requirements. Um, I started off recently with my 335R BMW, my midlife crisis. So I've lost some weight and I also bought a car. And the, the only thing I, I can't do is actually uh, get a motorbike. Yeah, I, I have tried, but I can't even reach the pedals for the, the motorbike. Um, and I uh, bolted on some pedals onto my uh, midlife crisis, and it's only failed me once. But th that really is the, the story that I want to start because that, that for a lot of people, that's really where accessibility starts, bolt on. If you have a wheelchair ramp up to your office, that's enough that people think that is uh, necessary. And then they get kind of confused around what, where do we go from that? How do we make the world really accessible uh, for individuals who have uh, requirements? Do we bolt things onto them? Or um, do we? What what do we actually do? And and I'm here today to tell you that bolt-on isn't the answer. What what is the answer um, is to make people. And I want to do another definition with accessibility. Not feel disabled. And I know that's a little ironic. We're in World Disability Day, and we're trying to make people not feel disabled. But disability only really comes about when you've got mismatched human interactions. And, and I'll tell you a story. So I bought, as part of my midlife crisis, I bought one of those fancy uh, or an AI scales. You get onto the scale and you put your details in there. So I put in, at the time, 65 kilos, uh, four foot one, 120 centimeters, and it had a crawling baby and it had a very tall man. And I thought, eee, this is not gonna end very well. So I put the let me let me put the baby there, and I thought this is this is a really big baby, and I jumped into the scale and it did its little calculation, uh, thinking, thinking, and uh, it uh, it said, whoa, you you shouldn't even be alive. Like it called me names that I don't know how the design system really came about with that, but it was I felt really upset, and I felt disabled at that time. 
because I realized that I had a mismatch human interaction because they hadn't thought of me as a person using their systems. I had been totally uh, looked um, looked over. And that really is disability because you only feel disabled when you have a mismatch human interaction. You don't go to a doctor and you say, oh, I'm feeling so terrible right now. And he goes, I think you've got the disability. The only time you feel disabled is when you don't have uh, and someone hasn't actually included you in that persona spectrum to uh, engage with your activity. So that's defining accessibility, that giving you a little bit of background in me and also um, de debunking disability. It doesn't exist. So that's um, so that's interesting in terms of like your experience of accessibility in the real world. Today, I guess we're here with a technical community of people thinking about software development, how would you describe or characterize accessibility in those terms? You know, I, I saw an interesting um, uh, tweet. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Rory Pretty, and uh, it said, uh, you know, uh, social distancing, it doesn't really uh, affect me. I've been social distanced my entire life. And that's the typical programmer. We've kind of gone, keep them away. Um, and, and, and in some sense also, people with really deep accessibility issues, we've been behind screens because we've always used digital to engage with uh, the world. We've really been first adopters of many technologies to try and make our lives uh, easier. So when the COVID climate hit, we, we've we kind of excelled in this because it's it's kind of like a, a denominator. Um, it's, it's, it's a leveler. It's made everyone similar. You don't know that I'm not in a wheelchair. Now, I'm not actually in a wheelchair, but I don't know that you're not in a wheelchair because we're all kind of sitting and facing the same. We're, we're, we're all kind of uh, leveled out in here. So when you when you take that kind of climate, you you also notice that it's a miraculous time for accessibility. We've got now digital disruption and and all of these uh, conference calls happening, and everyone now is saying captioning, color contrast, um, be able to uh, handle certain um, you know uh, uh, typing and. Uh, even fonts are uh, in the focus. And it's such an incredible time because there is a spotlight on accessibility requirements that has never really happened. Uh, Eight billion people now know what it's like to sit behind the digital interface and not have that human interaction. It's, I'm not saying that it's a great time to, to have these requirements only, but it's, it's kind of like a, an eye opener for a lot of people to say, wow, now we understand. Thank you. So um, it's interesting you, you talk about that kind of like mass adoption or kind of like realization about the need for that. There's there's a lot of kind of terminology flying flying around at the moment. So I might just throw some of those words at you and perhaps you can help give them some meaning for our community. So uh, the first is inclusive design. What, what do we mean when we start talking about that? OK, so um, inclusive design is actually very old. In the beginning, it was actually called user-centered design. And I've got a nice kind of um, a, a story that I can sh tell you that kind of will shed light on it. Now, I'm going to stand up. And, um, and so if I am an amputee, so I don't have use of my arm, and I'm using your, your website on my phone, so I would be uh, typing on your phone and let's just say it's a booking site for a, a plane ticket and I'm using your phone. Now, uh, you might want to go to your manager and say to them, um, can you please, uh, let's cater for that individual. Let's bolt on some software for that individual and cater for them. Now, the US Center for Statistics says that that individual, that, that amputee who was either born with an arm or had a, a, a disease on the arm is 26,000 people out of a population of 300 million people in the US. You wouldn't be able to justify that as a business uh, requirement. But when you look at the people with temporary disabilities, people who have had a motorcycle accident, motor vehicle accidents, or just fallen, then you get another 8 million people. 
What about the new parents? You know, you're, you're, you're saying to yourself, but uh, a new parent isn't, uh, you know, disabled. And I can tell you, I've got two kids and I, uh, parents are financially, mentally sleep deprived, you know, a, a lot of uh, issues. And when you're holding the newborn here in your hand and you're using your phone, you're in part of that, that persona spectrum. When you take that new parent, the, the amputee and the temporary uh, 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 disabled people, um, you get 21 million people. And now you can actually go, wow, that persona spectrum, we can cater for that. Now you take that persona spectrum, you superimpose it over the ticket buying process and you get the, the level of, of, of innovation. We believe at Microsoft that accessibility leads to innovation because now you can say, wait a second, I need responsive design, I need captures, I need voice prompts. And also right at the end of the process, I need AI adjustment to cater for if this didn't actually match the person's um, re requirements. And that really is a, a key differential in this new digital disruption that if we can't actually uh, cater for your requirements, stop, adjust, survey, um, measure, and then change the entire process, change the experience. And we'll we'll get to a little bit later. Um, I know that you've got a question around on how AI can learn to be emotionally context aware of the person to be able to cater for that also. Interesting. It's, it sounds like there's a huge opportunity there. Um, okay, another one, um, WCAG. I'm pretty sure I've said that wrong. What is WCAG all about? The Web Center for Accessibility Guidelines. Yes, and uh, everyone should know this word because the US Center uh, of uh, the, the federal government, the American federal government and the EU parliament has made it mandatory that in uh, next year, everyone has to be WCAG 2.1 AA compliant. Canada has already said yes, they will for publicly facing civil website or else you get a $100,000 fine per day. Do you remember GDPR? Do you remember how quick it hit us and it kind of all the websites overnight started having pop-ups that, uh, you know, made the web almost unusable? Accessibility is going to hit harder and faster if we don't actually look at how to drive uh, accessible software. So WCAG says it gives you principles. Can you see? Can you navigate? Um, can you uh, also, uh, it, uh, it won't overwhelm you like ADHD or autism. And then finally also, it uh, you won't break if you uh, introduce new technology, you won't break uh, the other uh, standards. Um, and, and, and it gives you pretty, pretty simple guidelines around that. And one of the things that we've made our software, Microsoft, is that we make our software WCAG, Web Center for Accessibility Guidelines, compliant before we deploy it. Um, so I, as an engineer, when I uh, create my software, um, I have all of these different AI tools that uh, analyze my software and tell me my score. Now we've open sourced that entire software and we've got a partner, DQ, DQ Labs, that has created the most incredible software. Now I'd like to share my screen here and give you a little bit of an introduction on how and what WCAG is and also how you can go by and see are you WCAG compliant uh, to be able to do that. So I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna switch on desktop sound also because it's always, I always like playing some videos also here uh, and do you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, so you see my screen, I'm just gonna make you yeah. big. Uh, okay, so so this is a nice site here, so it's w3.org and it's uh, the, the demos and you can see here, it's got uh, inaccessible and accessible. So the inaccessible really is uh, a site that people have gone, I'm gonna bolt on everything, I'm just gonna make it look nice and I'm, I'm not gonna really care about accessibility. You can see there that that image there, it doesn't have an alt tag when I go inspect here, it doesn't really have, uh, if you go there, image, there's there's no alt tag there. So a screen reader won't really read that that software out. You can also see here that they've done really terrible things with HTML. Now that's a list. So that should be an ally uh, uh, um, HTML tag. And if I go inspect here, you'll see there that they've actually used uh, BR tags to simulate a list uh, and P tags, which is the worst way of actually doing that with the list. That means that a, a screen reader or some accessible software won't be able to do that. And if you if you go to the accessible portion of that, it looks exactly the same because all they've done is they've taken HTML um, and make it uh, made it non-semantic, uh, really kind of just mishmash, a hot mess of that. Now, how do you test this? So we can go to the accessible site and we can go to the, the Chrome add-in so uh, it's free, so accessible insights for web. You can get it in the Chrome store or the Edge store. 
Uh, I know we've got an edge store now. Um, you can go in there, you can go fast pass assessment or ad hoc tools. So assessment gives you an entire view of um, uh, all of the compliant WCAG 3.1 tests that you need to do here. Uh, the AI success criteria takes you about an hour or so to do it and you can go all the way through that. And that's a great way to go uh, really uh, slowly through it. But you can also do fast pass, uh, which gives you a very quick um, overview of 25% uh, of the majority of the the really critical uh, success factors. So I can go in there and you'll see that that's the site that, and it's got not failed uh, instances, that's the correct site. Now, if we go to the uh, the inaccessible site, we should see a, a lot more errors here. Going through here, I'm gonna go fast pass. And yeah, it gives me the report here. I can got the vis uh, visual helper on, and we'll go to that now. Color contrast, it goes through all of that. And you can you can export this re uh, result there and also, but. This has already existed for very uh, long. Chrome had this in Lightbox, but the novelty here is that we've actually added this as a visual representation also on the site. So if I go here and I go into that uh, that image there, I can click on it. It says the image elements have alternative text or uh, a role of none or presentation. Alt image there. We can have one, it's even 1.111 and you can go inspect HTML, copy the failure details or file an issue. You can link GitHub to here and then fix one of the following also. So it gives you the overview and the ability to, to fix that though. So if, you, if you're not familiar with WCAG, you can actually go in and get the tool to see exactly where you are and start the journey of seeing how accessible your software is. Then you can also use some of the ad hoc tools here. So for example, and we have uh, so ad hoc tools here, tab stops, and you can see this site here, uh, it just kind of stops right there on tab stops. It's not nav navigable. But if I go to the accessible page and I switch on uh, tab stops here, I can also test and see that this is really uh, navigable and uh, WCAG compliant when it comes to navigation. You can also use color uh, to go in here and go uh, color. I'm just going to switch off my side. I'm having real big problems with my electric fence uh, right now. And what happens is I think that I, I've killed nearly every single lizard known to man. Every single time uh, a lizard kind of pops onto my electric fence, I, I, I murder it and then I, I get a call from the, the armed response. So I really don't want to do that while, while we're having it. So you can switch off um, uh, color here and you can also view headings, order, uh, go to the automate checks, landmarks. There's so many different ways that you can use this tool. And this is the same tool also that we've integrated into our DevOps pipeline. So what you see here on that page, you also can go in and create uh, unit tests for this using DQ Labs uh, JavaScript engine, and it runs in uh, Ruby uh, and Java and .NET. And I've got a really nice demo if we have some time here. I wanna create an accessible pipeline for you. So this is an accessible pipeline that I have run uh, just before the, the session here. And you'll see here that it actually runs the scripts against the websites. And it's, it's pretty quick to create over here. To create an accessible pipeline, you just go into, and this is Azure DevOps, which is free for open source uh, tooling. You go new pipeline here. So it's gonna take uh, 30 seconds to actually create here. We're gonna to go to uh, GitHub. I'm creating a, a, the same project that I've got here. It just checks uh, some uh, websites here. So you can sign up with Azure DevOps. And then I'm gonna go there and go X uh, Maven pipelines here. Uh, let's just wait for it. Okay, we wanna scan there. There we go, X Maven pop. Uh, X Maven samples, was that it? I think that was it. Let, let's go again. Let's. Let's go again because I think I actually did. I'm way too excited on World Disability Day right now. So I think I'm clicking way too quickly. I've also got this lovely uh, magic mouse, which I, I just I, I actually uh, love it. Okay, so let's go to GitHub and I can show you it, uh, how to do that afterwards. Um, so you, you select your, uh, your repository here and I'm going to search for uh, Maven. Maven's a build tool that actually runs our scripts there. So I'm gonna do uh, uh, Rory P uh, and I want a Spring X, yeah, the X core Maven. So I did actually choose the wrong uh, thing there and then I'm gonna choose that uh, Maven there. Um, and you can see there, I'm just gonna run the scripts there exactly like a, uh, if I were to run it by a command and I go save and run. Um, that's fine, save and run. And this is that's all I needed to do. So I've got my, my scripts running and I can uh, test an external uh, project or I can test 
static uh, pages that are running locally on uh, my PC, uh, creating the pipeline. Remember, you get uh, one pipeline for free. If you want to run 10 concurrent pipelines, then you can actually do that. And if you have an open source project, you get those 10 concurrent pipelines for free on uh, with uh, Azure, Azure DevOps. You can go into the job here and you'll see there that it's running. It's going to run the, the scripts there. And I do have one that is already that has already run because this might take a, a few seconds uh, to run here. I've got my, my pipelines that have uh, already been created. And you'll see there that it's it's not bolt on because I can do this from the beginning of the, the project uh, towards the end of the project at any point of the project. I can test my results if it is checked in. Um, I can just uh, trigger the, the the test there, and then I can get my results here as part of the Maven uh, the test results here. Um, so that's that's also key to what I want to show you that with CAG you can test it throughout the entire process of your uh, project, not only bolt on with the um, the uh, the insights uh, the accessibility insights, but throughout the entire software development life cycle. You um you mentioned a few different programming languages there. Are there any which have any accessibility features built in, kind of natively, or would you need to use something like WCAG on top of? Yes. So, uh, in, did you ever wonder why HTML4 took so long to become HTML5? Uh, the reason for that is because HTML4 was such a mishmash of mess that they didn't know what to do with it. So what you know what they looked towards? They looked at something called ARIA. Now ARIA is if you if you type it in here, um, ARIA uh, 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 standard. Let's go standard. I just want to get the the, the So uh, it's called WA ARIA, and it is the accessibility rich internet application suite of web standard. Now that's a big mouthful, but what that means is it's creating a rich uh, uh, experience for people to kind of create their websites to cater for people with accessibility requirements. So what happened was HTML5 looked to ARIA and uh, to create that rich experience, that semantically clean HTML, and then said, wait a second, let's actually uh, not clone, but let's model HTML5 on ARIA. So if you create semantically sound uh, HTML5 sites, you've got a, a, an actual accessible website. Uh, uh, paired with the fact that you can run all of the X core engines inside your uh, DevOps pipeline and every language becomes accessible because then you're creating your websites or your Android apps or all of your uh, PWA apps in an accessible software and you're using your backend software then to test it. So it's really a, 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 a great time for accessible software because there's so many different tools that you can use to create and to check your accessibility requirements. I would imagine that um, artificial intelligence has quite a big role to play here potentially. Are there any um, ways that AI can be used right now to, to help accessibility? Yes, I've got some really interesting demos. So the first demo I want to show you is uh, around captioning. Now, if you go into Word or PowerPoint or Outlook, uh, like if I if I open up PowerPoint right now, I want to show you something uh, very interesting. So if I go into Microsoft PowerPoint and I uh, attach an image onto PowerPoint, it's going to give me an alt image definition of that, that a screen reader software. So let's go file, uh, new presentation. So this is uh, a completely uh, blank print presentation and I'm going to attach an image onto here. So uh, I'm going to go uh, insert and pictures and uh, we can let, let's 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 go off script a little bit. I know that uh, James, you don't like me going off script here. Let's go stock <laughs> images here. Um, let's see if we've got any stock images here and and uh, uh, so nature. So uh, a building. Uh, yeah, so let's go a building. And uh, we're going to go insert one. Now, this is a building, and I think this is uh, Toronto. No, Shanghai. This is Shanghai. Now, if, if I look at the alt image here, I can go um, uh, review. Uh, no, I want to go uh, picture format, and I want to go uh, alt text on the image. And it will say here, oh, it's already done it. Uh, generate a description for me. So I can generate a description for me. And this is using AI to generate there a city a skyline with tall buildings. 
and it generated that description. And this is the same technology that we're using with AI to create your accessible software. And this is something called computer vision. What we've done is that we've paired uh, computer vision with linguistics to allow you the ability to get a real textual representation for that. So I've got a, a nice little bot demo called Caption Bot, and we're going to play a little game, James and I also. And I, I showed you the images last time, James, but now let's see if you can define them. And I want you to define them in human words, and then I'm going to show you how AI does it, because with uh, the new revelations with AI, we actually beat human beings. So with no caps, which is a competition that Facebook runs, we proved that we can do this better. We have human parity, even higher than human parity uh, description. So yeah, describe that to me, James, that picture. Uh, that would be a baseball player, I would say. OK, so let's see. So if, if you were if you were to define a baseball player, and I were to uh, read that with a screen reader. Uh, let's see what the AI would uh, define that. So let's, uh, it's going analyzing the image. I think it's a baseball player preparing to spring a bat, uh, to swing a bat. It understands that the context is necessary to also give someone the ability to see what the action is. And the only reason they did that is because they learned this from billions and billions of images and scanning the contextual representation um, of that linguistics aligned to that image. And that's really the captioning bot that, that you, you want to do. So I've got one more demo uh, assigned to that also. So you can use these cognitive services as part of uh, your uh, program. So I've got uh, over here and I'm going to go do, do, do. Cognitive service with quick start. All of these are available on GitHub. And uh, in this cognitive services, I've got a remote image that we're going to scan and you're going to give me your description and then we're going to see if you can match uh, the description that uh, we're going to do. We're also going to age the people in the, the image and see if we can kind of get a good age in that. So if you could give me the, the description of that, uh, James. Oof. OK, so we have uh, President Obama in the middle. Uh, he's the two men either side of him that they're, they're holding, hugging each other, embraced, uh, taking a selfie, actually. And I think that's Bill Nye, potentially yes, yes. the scientist. And Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yes, yes that's, that's good. good. But, and but it's the, the context also of what you're trying to describe it, because your mind is also going to the point of how do these people relate to me? You're not being objectified. So let's see what the, the AI says here. We also want to see how uh, the age, we want to age these people. We also want to get a little bit of description. We want to see the categories, the tags, uh, the face descriptions, whether it's racy images or, uh, you know, uh, violent images, because you might want to sense uh, sense out that, the, the actual color profile of the images and then the image type. So we're going to run this here. Uh, and this is written in Java and this is all uh, the uh, cognitive services demo that you can do. Remember, you can actually run this also uh, in the back end or the front end of your systems. It's analyzing the image there. And let's see what it, it did there. OK, cool. It says Bull Nye, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Barack Obama are posing for a picture with a confidence level that's actually 0 0.5. So that's a really high confidence level. And that really gives me the context if I was on a website of exactly what I want to do with my alt image uh, linked to that. And that's the same thing you get in Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, OneNote, and uh, in, uh, a lot of the other readers. You also get it had a person's smile, uh, clothing, suit, and then the age of the people, 58, 47, and 51. I'm guessing that uh, that may have been um, uh, uh, Obama at 47. I think that was his first term. And then uh, 58 is Bill Nye and 51 is Neil uh, deGrasse uh, Tyson. It's not racy images. It's not uh, adult content. And then also the dominant color and then also the celebrities there that with a very high confidence. So this is really the where AI uh, has allowed you to have computer vision. And I've got one more demo to show you around Immersive Reader. I don't know if you've heard about Immersive Reader. And Immersive Reader is actually uh, built into uh, PowerPoint Edge um, mark, uh, Microsoft uh, tooling. And what Immersive Reader allows you to do is 
wait a second, I, I have a website, I can't create it accessible, but you can create it accessible if you use the immersive reader cognitive services. So I've got another tool here, and what I've done is I've put the text of the tool as the uh, the, the Wikipedia entry for the uh, UN uh, Day for Disability. Um, so let's just find here, and I've got the quick start for immersive reader. So I've got a website here, um, it's a, a, a Java server pages, uh, and in the, the, the JSP, it's just got some text there that says uh, that um, uh, the, uh, the international uh, observance for the, uh, the, the varying degrees of success around the planet for the day of disabilities to understand uh, a disability issues. And then I've also got some different languages there. Now I want to create an accessible website, but I want to use it with AI. So I'm going to uh, embed here a little button on the side there to say uh, this is a, and call the immersive reader. So it's a cognitive services, costs about three cents for a million transactions, the same as that computer vision there. So very economical. Now I'm going to run this uh, in a terminal, so new terminal. And I'm going to run it. This is using uh, Tomcat, Maven, Tomcat uh, 7 colon run. And it's going to bind to port uh, 8888. And then we're going to open it up. We're going to see our page there. And we're going to see how easy it is to create an accessible version of that page. So let's open up here. And goodbye, Obama. Let's see if whether we can get our immersive reader quick start. Now we've got our immersive uh, reader quick start. And we've got uh, International Day of Persons with Disability is an international observance promoted by the United Nations since 1992. Now I want to get that read to me and I also want to have other services available. So I can click on immersive reader. And it's going to make the, the entire experience change. Now remember the silver generation, uh, the generation over 65 also has visual requirements. And now I get the International Day of Dis Persons is an international observance. And I international Day of Persons with Disabilities, you can December see 3rd, now. is an international observance. And now I can go in and change the textual preferences if I want to do. I can also change the grammar so I can uh, identify the syllables, the nouns, the adverbs, the labels. Um, and then I can go uh, click on that and it'll give me nations, the textual representation. This is the same uh, technology we use for schools. One billion children are using this to read. And then I can also go in here and I'm gonna choose a language and we've just re recently done. So what language uh, is Welsh a language? Uh, yes, Welsh. Welsh is a language and I'm gonna do the document. And now I can actually, let's just see if this, I can read it in Welsh. And this is just for, for Emma. Uh, but it's not going to read it back because it doesn't have uh, Welsh here, but I can actually go in there and read it in, um, let's, let's do Chinese, uh, Chinese simplified China. And uh, and whole document, let's just see if we get that whole document. Now, can, uh, without changing... And also, we can get this for, uh, the autism spectrum and ADHD, we can do line focus. And now you have a whole Kindle-like experience that you can actually go through, all with just using AI and cognitive services on top of computer vision. There's so many opportunities to really change the way that you look at the world and, and design software through the use of AI. So it looks like, excuse me, that AI and cognitive can do a ridiculous amount. Is there a risk that we're losing the personal or emotional kind of nuances if we if, if we kind of purely rely on these? So uh, Microsoft and a lot of other uh, large uh, companies have something called an emotional intelligence team. And that's not, you know, like what my wife actually says that I lack. It's actually a team that builds in emotional intelligence into your AI. Because, so I had an experience, I, I built a little, uh, a, a custom skill into an Alexa uh, uh, skill. And um, I did a public talk and I put the Alexa uh, robot down and um, I said to her, please pass the, uh, the butter, which is based on Rick and Morty, pass the butter robot. And it says, um, oh no, I, I have no purpose to live. And I said, please just pass the butter. And it said, I don't understand what you're trying to say. And I kept on screaming at it. And, and, and I had a revelation there because I realized that if I was, had an accessibility requirements and I was screaming there and I had fallen in a shower 
and it didn't understand my emotional uh, distort. How 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 is this going to help me? So what people have been doing is they've been building in emotional awareness into AI. And remember, right at the end of your experience of that that uh, uh, plane booking trip with the persona spectrum, you want to be able to have that engagement with intelligent AI. So they've been building intelligence into AI, and you're asking yourself how. So I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm going to introduce you to Deepmoji. The Deepmoji is a MIT project that was really at the forefront at the beginning of uh, teaching uh, emotion to AI. This is a model that has been trained on 55 billion tweets. So at the end of your tweet, you always put a, a, a emoji, right? A happy face, sad face, sarcasm face. And what they did is they scanned that, and then they they took the 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 kind of uh, trans they they transposed the the emotional syntax for those tweets against the actual uh, text and broke it up and learned uh, uh, with that uh, model. You can actually use the model there. And they taught an AI emotional intelligence. So let's, let's teach it sarcasm. You know, in South Africa, we have questionable electricity. So I'm going to go the ele le uh, electricity is off again. And I'm going to be sarcastic. I'm going to go, oh, joy. I misspelled uh, <laughs> electricity. I, I did go to private school, so I get to I get to misspell whatever I want. I spent 12 years in private school. Electricity is off uh, again. Oh joy, and that's sarcasm, which is the um, the the change of polarity of sentiment. And sarcasm is the the hardest uh, emotion to understand. Now, if I'm being sarcastic, don't send me a happy. Wow, everything is happy there. Actually, respond to me and adjust your engagement. So I'm going to go submit. It's going to give me the emotional syntax flow back in emojis, and you can also get the sentiment flow. And you can see there it understands that I'm being sarcastic. And it's that exact same um, type of AI that we're building into Cortana, into Siri into all of your AI intelligent uh, tools that you have there. So when you scream in distraught, in pain, in anguish, we won't actually respond to you in a monotone, I'm sorry, hell, that I can't do that. But we will respond to you with empathy and compassion and uh, how you want to be treated as a human being. It's pretty powerful stuff. Thank you, Rory. Um, I think we've covered an immense amount there in quite a short time. We have actually um, compiled a cloud skills challenge, which brings together a lot of the learning modules that we have available on this. Uh, Roy, did you want to go into that in a bit more detail, Roy? So you can learn around uh, the, the MS Learn. So Microsoft uh, Learn Accessibility. Uh, and in that, uh, when you go into the accessibility fundamentals, most of the uh, ideas that I've, I've talked to you about are covered by that. So what is disability and accessibility, language, inclusion, the Microsoft accessibility features and tools, the accessibility toolkit, immersive reader, creating accessible content with Microsoft 365, digital accessibility, app development, and then also, and once you do that, you actually get accreditation around it with experience points and badges linked to that. Also, if you want to get more around uh, Microsoft accessibility, you can go to microsoft.com forward slash accessibility and you get everything that I've mentioned there today, products and services, hearing new diversity, uh, learning mobility, mental health, everything's available there. Um, and uh, you'll see that we're on a journey with you. So Microsoft believes that we here to empower everyone in every organization to achieve more, which includes people who have accessibility requirements. Thank you, Rory. That sounds like a fantastic note to leave it on. Thank you everyone who joined today. Uh, and I've dropped the link of the uh, challenge which uh, compiles all of those learning modules for you there. So that's in the chat. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Rory. Thanks, James. Thanks, Emma. And follow me on Twitter at Rory Pretty. Reach out to us. We're here to be with you on that journey to get you to that accessibility milestones. Thanks everyone. Cheers. Thanks, everyone.